Outrocast. Alan, aside from speaking with me today, good day for you so far? Uh, pretty good, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Walked well, the dog, went for a 5K run, that sort of thing. Wow, I, that's right. You're six or so hours ahead of us here in New York. So you've had a full day, whereas I'm still kind of starting a day. Have you always been a morning person, or did you learn after years of touring to become more of a morning person? Um, yeah, I guess I've, I, I like mornings. Um, I've gone through the, uh, the, the the night person, you know, in my younger days, but um, I prefer mornings, yeah. Well, in terms of the touring lifestyle, you're one of those people has so much going on that it's tough to know where to start. But Dire Straits Legacy is how we were connected, DSL for sure. Uh, how much rehearsal is needed for you, considering that these are songs that you played for a lot of years, but it's new virtuoso musicians that had to learn it? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, all the rehearsals are for them, really, rather than for me. Although if we dig out a, a new tune, that we haven't played for a long time, and we're talking, you know, thirty years. Then, um, yeah, I might have to um, might have to review it. I mean, right across the river was is, is a tune we've started doing, um, and I haven't played that since um, nineteen ninety two, maybe, or even before. I can't remember now, but yeah. So we we started doing that a few months ago, and um, that's in the set now. And that, that's a tricky thing to play, but it's kind of like a muscle memory, really. I, I mean, as soon as yeah. I started. As soon as I played it twice, I kind of knew it immediately. I, I was right back to playing it the way I used to. Now, Dire Straits is one of those bands that means different things in different countries. So, for example, us here in the States, Brother in Arms is, you know, arguably the peak because of Money for Nothing and the MTV thing. And then you go to other countries and you realize Dire Straits is a top five all-time band still. You know, it, it, there were dozens of hits. So is the set list different from country to country when DSL is performing? Um, not particularly, no, because we, we do, I mean, there, is, there, there are about 10 songs that have to be played. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then the rest of them, you know, then there's four or five we can kind of um, throw in or, or leave out. And, um, th and that's what we do. But yeah, most of the time, the, the set remains pretty much the same. Got it. So it's amazing to me with your career, and I don't use the word amazing a lot. You know, a lot of people are rock and roll hall of famers. Yes, a lot of people are in a big band, et cetera. But that while Dire Straits was going on or going on break, the other jobs and sessions you had going on at the same time, you're one of those people that doesn't seem like they slept a lot in the 80s. Well, I did, actually, and I windsurfed quite a lot, actually. I spent a lot of time windsurfing. And... Um... But uh, yeah, I managed to um, get a lot of uh, lot of stuff down, which looks good on my CV. Let's say that. Yeah. So while Dire Straits was still at its peak in terms of productivity, the Tina Turner gig, the Sessions gigs, was that out of the idea of "Hey, I like to work, I like to keep busy," or was it a "Hey, I got to make as much money as possible while I can"? Where does the mindset go to go? I'm going to take on all these gigs because. Your average musician goes, I'm off. Well, then I'm off. Yeah, but when Eric Clapton asks you to join his band, you don't say no. It took me about four seconds to say yes. I must admit, I did, during those four seconds, I did think, yeah. can I be after this, you know? But uh, yeah, but it was four seconds. And of course, it, uh, I mean, Eric, playing with Eric was a joy, an absolute joy. And T oh, Tina too, uh, Tina asked me to, I couldn't say no. You know, so so I, I joined Tina for a, little, a short while and then she made me her musical director. And that was and I said, well, I can't tour with you, but I can help you. Um, I mean, I did tour with her and then she asked me to MD. So um, I said, well, I'll do that, but I'll do it on a consultancy basis. Help you get the band together, which is what I did. I'd fly across to L.A., spend three weeks there rehearsing with the band and say goodbye and then. Then occasionally I might have to go out on the road to um, fill in for a keyboard player or whatever. That happened about twice, I think. But yeah, so, you know, there are some things you, you can't say no to, really. No, just huge artists like that, like Eric Clapton, Tina Turner, while still in dire straits. I don't think that the average person makes all that connection to realize that you have all those credits outside of there. Is that something that you ever think about? Because my impression of Alan Clark 
has always been that you were intentionally low key. Yeah, I am intentionally low key. Um, the only time I ever think about it is when people like you remind me. <laughs> well, yeah, whenever anyone describes you, they go Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, Alan Clark. Did the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction change your life in any way besides that becoming the first sentence, part of the first sentence, rather? It's not, so, it's not part of my first sentence, that's for sure. Um, it's, it sits on my mantelpiece and I look at it occasionally and, and um, think that's nice. But um, <laughs> other than that, I don't, uh, I don't really think about it, you know. I mean, it's, it's a great honour, I guess, and um, it's kind of like being given some sort of medal for 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 uh, campaign achievements or whatever but um yeah it's i i don't uh i don't give it um you know i don't i don't wake up thinking yeah i'm a member of the hall of fame by any no, stretch some people do some people will regularly have that elevator pitch ready where they want to tell you everything that they've done so they get treated a little differently again not alan clark here and those Credits also include CEO and Rod Stewart. You know, it's just this great who's who of rock. How much of that happened via management or people pitching you versus just being at the pub or being friends with the people and them going, hey, are you around in a couple of hours? Well, those two artists happened because of my friend Trevor Horn, the, the ah. producer. So that's how I became involved with them. Got it. So sometimes it's the producer going, hey, this guy's good. Sometimes it's at management or did management not rope you into a lot of things like other artists would have? Um, yeah, management have now and again. Um, I did audition for, uh, go along to an audition for Mick Jagger one time and it just, it just didn't, I just didn't feel comfortable. So that wasn't, that wasn't one I, I've got down on my CV, I don't think so. Um, uh, but uh, yeah. Um, management yeah i mean producers producers definitely give me a shout and recommend me or whatever so got it so how much do you play music when you're not on the road um i try to do at least a couple of hours every day on the piano oh to to try and keep just 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 to keep my chops together because the older i get the less easy the harder it is to 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 be able to play what I used to play back in you know 40 years ago or whatever but um I'm still succeeding so that's good I see the soundproofing behind you on the wall I see that foam right there so yeah. you have a good home setup for your playing I've got a small I've got a small studio which I'm in now with pro tools and um and uh, yeah I can make a good noise in here <laughs> when did you start to embrace pro tools was it a tough onboarding for you it was a reluctant start, but um, I, I got invited um, in the early 90s. I, I was invited to do um, some BBC um, TV uh, shows, like um, series, the music mm -hmm. for, like there'd be eight episodes and I have to you know, do the music for that. And at the time I was less inclined to tour because I had uh, two young children, twins, who, were at, who in the early 90s would have been three, four years old. So I was spending time with them because I'd missed the first year of their lives by being out on the road with Dire Straits. Right. In fact, the first, the, really the first three years of their lives. So, um, so uh, yeah, I started doing TV work and um, to do it properly, I needed, I needed Pro Tools. So I started working with Guy Fletcher, who, who is the other keyboard player in Dire Straits, and he had Pro Tools. So I would, I would, um, I think I was, I can't remember what system I was using, but I would, record the ideas down onto my system, take them to Guy's studio. He would load them up into Pro Tools and I would lie on the floor and just tell him what to do and, um, and watch, watch how he worked Pro Tools. And um, so that's how I learned how to do Pro Tools. I learned how to, what Pro Tools would do. What I didn't know was there were the instructions you put inside of it. And so for the next few weeks, I'd be on the phone to Guy 10 times a day asking, how do I do this? How do I do that? And I have to say, Guy was incredibly receptive and and um, uh, big thanks to Guy for, um, I mean, that was like 20 odd years ago. Now I'm pretty damn good on it. Once you became well-versed with Pro Tools, were you able to get rid of most of your gear going, hey, we got the plugins that sound exactly like this, or you're more the authentic person that still has all the Moogs? 
Well, I appreciate the, the, the original stuff and I've got some bits and bobs. I've got a, um, I've got a profit line around profit five from, from back in the day. And um, I've got a, a rack mounted mini Moog um, over there. Um, I've got loads of stuff, but yeah, I tend to tend to use plugins because the plugins are so great these days. Less to carry amongst uh, other things. Always sounds perfect. You don't have to repair the, the old keyboard. Well, the big thing is, the big thing is, you can go back to a previous mix and instantly go back to it. Yes, you couldn't do that before with with analog. I mean, it was such a pain. But I mean, the, there are obvious advantages to analog, you know. But I mean, for instance, my friend Trevor Horn, he uses plugins all the time for that reason because he, he just keeps revisiting mixes until he and he plays around with them all the time until it until he's happy with it well, i've been doing why. a project with him for the past um three years which is coming to fruition at the oh. end of this year sometime what exactly and, uh, is that project because trevor like yourself i if, if you said hey alan clark's got a thing i couldn't tell you what genre it was going to be what tempo it's going to be it's not like the ramones here where you go alan clark yeah he could do classical he could do jazz he could do blues i don't know what it is so what is it that you and trevor would be working on uh it's a it's i can't say too much because it's um it's a it's a you know it'll it'll spoil the release but um right it's um it's it's original tunes, tunes that have been hits in the past, maybe or, or well known well known tunes, done in a completely different way, sung by somebody else. That's probably the best way of putting it. Fantastic. So, yeah. so DSL's happening. This Trevor thing. You're not one of those people that has to work, but you choose to work. Now, you mentioned playing still for hours a day. Do you take lessons, or is it just? jamming yourself by alone in the studio i haven't taken lessons since i was um well really nine years old but I, I guess i did i did a couple of years of piano lessons when i was at college so yeah but i'm completely self-taught really hmm. i think everything that i know i think is self-taught I'm aware of a lot of virtuoso musicians who are self-taught who at a certain age go, ah, I got to learn the real way here. And they take lessons, but it's super under the radar or they go to Juilliard under the radar, that kind of thing. So you still didn't go back to lessons like that. No, because I guess I learned back then everything I yeah. need to know. I mean, I can read music. I mean, I, and I spent years playing in clubs and nightclubs where sight reading was, 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 uh, was important. Because an artist would turn up and say, "Right, there you go. Here's here's yeah, my here's set. The chart. Yeah. Here's the charts. <laughs> Let's go." So um, yeah, I mean, I was never really great at it, but um, you know, I got pretty good. And it's been a a real advantage because most musicians in rock rock don't have that that ability to write music. So I can write, I can arrange, and you know, all sorts of things. I rarely do it because I can do it all on Pro Tools now and, and make a big orchestral noise on that, you know. But um, yeah, occasionally, occasionally I'll, I'll get to um, what I've been doing recently with working with Trevor is is I'll do the strings and then they, and then Julian, uh, this other, this guy who who's a, um, works with orchestras, he takes my ideas and turns them into or, or, for the orchestra. So um, yeah, which is which is. Perfect, really. I just sit back and let him get on with it. Wow. Well, three non-musical uh, career, non-DSL questions for you, and then I'll let you go. Because these are things that I'm very curious about with people at your high level. And I'm the one who said that you're at the high level, not yourself, because you're a modest <laughs> dude. But uh, the first one is, I find that musicians either have music playing 24-7 in their households or never, and they want the silence because they've listened to too much music. Which one are you? I'm the latter because um, I have I just have music in my head all the time. I'll I'll go to bed with a tune in my head and I'll wake up in the morning and it's still there. Or I'll 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 write a tune during the night. I'll wake up and get a, a musical idea and and so on. So yeah, I I'm the latter. I I, I rarely play music and I, I I chastise myself for this because when I do, I really love hearing what everybody else is doing, what other people are doing but um yeah I, I i am the latter in the car i have radio four on with bbc radio four which is which is only talking there's no music hmm. 
And do you also have tinnitus as well, where you hear the high pitches accidentally? Uh, yeah, a little bit, but um, yeah, but it doesn't bother me musically. Oh, okay, that's good to hear. Um, mm. next next question: What's the last concert that you went to for fun? You know, not that you were music directing, not that hey, Alan might come up on stage. What's the last thing that you went to for actual enjoyment? The 1975. So you've never been a concert person for fun. I didn't like the idea of going through the doors of the, the audience that I, that way into it into, into a concert. No, I didn't like that because it's so wow. unusual for me. Uh, yeah, then, the 1975. I, I was I, I was at Matty Matty Healy, the the singer in the 1975. I was at his his um, his christening when when he was. So I I know his parents. I grew up. He grew up in in a village that I lived in Northumberland, and um, and I and so I know his parents very well. And um, and I keep in touch with Matty, yeah, so. Wow. Well, the last thing I want to know here is obviously you're a family guy, but what's, aside from family, what's the number two for you besides music? The more musicians I speak with, the more I find out that it's golf or fishing is what they do when they're not working and doing the music stuff. Never been into either of those things. I've always avoided, I've always said, if anybody ever sees me playing golf, shoot me through the head, please. Um, I did get big into windsurfing, and before that, I was big into scuba diving. This is way back, you know. But um, I'm 71, so both things are oh, certainly windsurfing is um, kind of out of the question now. And oh, you know, um, what am I into? Well, I go I go to the gym and I swim. I, I keep myself fit. I guess that's that's what my focus is outside of music, really. Well, when you look at the tour routing of Alice Cooper, you realize that there is a golf course within X number <laughs> of miles of every yeah. tour stop. So it yeah. sounds like there has to be an ocean or a pool within a certain number of miles for you to play there. That really helps. Yeah, there's always a pool in, in a hotel, usually, you know, um, but and, and the sea, if the, if the sea is, is visible, I'll go there. Makes sense. Well, hey, Alan, thank you for the many years of great art. Looking forward to the next New York area show that you're playing at with DSL. And thank you for being you all these years later and not the Alan Clark politician, the Alan Clark keyboardist. <laughs> not the singer from the Hollies. Somebody wrote, somebody wrote to my website recently. I mean, there's my website. It's quite yeah. clear what it says. You know, uh, somebody wrote and said, uh, oh, I love, I've always loved your singing in the, in the Hollies and, and so on, you know. <laughs> I mean, bus, bus Stop is a great song and all, but that's not you. That's, uh, that's Alan Clark number two. And the well, politics, Alan Clark number three. There's another story there. Actually, I was in a, I was in a hotel in uh, Sydney, Australia in 1986 when Brothers in Arms was the biggest, we were the biggest band in the world. Walked yeah. up to the elevator in the hotel and uh, there's Alan Clark from the Hollies, who, you know, he's a bit older than me. So when I was young, I would see Alan Clark on the on the TV and it was, you know, it was, he was my, you know, my namesake. And he said to me, Alan, can I have your autograph? It was surreal, really, you know. Well, hey, you are slash were in the biggest band in the world. So it's going to happen. Every weird thing is going to have to happen when that's the case. But hey, thank you and, uh, uh, so much. And thank you for your patience with all these questions as well, Alan. I've enjoyed it, man. Outrocast.